two, three. Good evening. We're trying to get sight and sound together here, and hopefully by now you can see me and hear me. And by the time we do all of this, I kind of forget what I'm going to say, so stay with me, please, uh, in this world of, well, something I'm not that good at, but it happens. So good evening, and thank you, Barbara, for letting me know you're there. Um, I've been thinking the past couple of weeks about a number of different things, and I'd like to share two of them with you this evening. Okay. Um, one is, oh, a couple of weeks ago I couldn't sleep. And I know a number of women have this. You just wake up at three o'clock in the morning and there you are at three o'clock in the morning. So I was roaming around a little bit and then I decided to put the TV on. Well, there's, there's very little on at three o'clock in the morning. Even if you have 75 channels, I think that's what I have. It's no. the me medium package. Okay. And I was just flipping through the channels and I came across a show that was on in the 90s, The Golden Girls. Now, some of you may remember The Golden Girls. I have a picture of them here. Here's The Golden Girls. Okay? It was a great, great show. It was a story of four women who lived together and they actually lived life together. Their daily joys and their challenges, and it was 22 minutes of engaging humor, caring, and a point. I think that's a pretty good observation for three o'clock in the morning, right? And I just, I wound up watching a couple of them. I think it was a Golden Girl marathon or something, and it was thoroughly enjoyable. The second thing I was thinking about these days is about life's journey. I had a birthday, that does it to you, right? And what are the helps to direct me along the path that God wants me to walk? And what came to my mind is something I used to get a number of years ago. It was from Triple A, and it was called a Trip Tick. Does anybody remember a Trip Tick? I brought you a picture of it. This is what it looks like. Okay? You got a little book, and each page gave you a little bit of the journey. I like this because it didn't show the whole thing, and you don't get overwhelmed. You just have to follow this page. Hi, Cookie Cassidy. And it just I, I just love the trip tick. I don't know if they still have them, but I do know that I'm not that good with GPS. Michelle is my witness. We were in the car and the GPS gave up on us and we were on the Long Island Expressway and the GPS actually said, I don't know how to help you. <laughs> and we went, what? Like, now my trip tick knew how to help me because it gave me this section of the journey. And I started to think, what? If we could put these two things together, a good story that was engaging and had a point, and short segments of how to take in the way I should go as a follower of Jesus, the way I should go. You know, it's not like looking at Route 80 across the country all at once. It's this segment through through northern New Jersey. I can do that. And then the next segment. It's the same way in life. We don't see the whole thing at once. It's little pieces at a time. An engaging story with a point and a segment of how I should go. Well, the more I thought about that, and I did think about it for quite some time, I realized that Jesus had already done this and it is called the parables. Each one, a short story, engaging, makes a point about the kingdom of God and shows us a direction to go in. Wow, I never thought of that before. Now, Jesus was not the first one to use parables. Jewish history is filled with parable stories 
and in the Old Testament we have a number of them. Probably the most famous story before the stories of Jesus was about King David. I love this story. Okay. King David had his downfalls, okay? And one of them was a lovely, beautiful woman named Bathsheba. Bathsheba was married to one of his chiefs in his military. And the military went off to fight a battle. And David did not go with them. And he kind he lusted, not kind of, he lusted after Bathsheba. Now, he already had a whole harem, but he wanted what he wanted. And he had her husband killed in battle, her husband murdered, so he could have Bathsheba. Now, in the court of the king was a prophet, and his name was Nathan. And Nathan couldn't take this. He just could not accept this, what the king had done. And one of his jobs was to present before the king situations, and the king would make a decision on them. So he went before the king and he said to him, I want to tell you a story about a little poor farmer and only thing he had was a little lamb. <clears throat> he loved this lamb. He carried it around. He treated it like it was his own child. But the king, the king had lots and lots of sheep. A traveler was coming from another kingdom and the king had to provide a meal. He decided he did not want to give up any of his sheep. So he sent someone to take the sheep from the poor farmer, the little lamb he loved so much, had it slaughtered and served for dinner. So Nathan looks at King David and says, Your Highness, what do you think of that? Well, David gets furious. That king was wrong. He shouldn't have done that. He should be held responsible. And Nathan looked at him and said, that king is you. And Nathan lived to tell the tale because when David heard it, he actually fell on the floor crying, contrite for what he did. Great story, great parable, engaging and had a point. But of all the people who told parables, Jesus, was the master at the short story. There's questions about how many parables are actually in the Gospels because not everything is a parable. But it's about 36 that are recorded. Most of them in Luke. I believe there's 14 in Matthew, about six in Mark. Okay? But the amazing thing about these stories that Jesus told even people who aren't familiar with the scripture, they still know some of the parables. For example, the lost sheep. The sower went to sow his seed. The story of the prodigal son. Why do they know it if they weren't raised Christian? Because Jesus used common things. He'd look around, kind of like me in Belport. <laughs> look around. You see it. Use it. Tell it to the people. It's in front of them. He was in an agricultural society. He could talk about weeds and wheat and sowing seed and animals. They knew it. They lived it. Maybe today we might have the parable of the lost cell phone. Can you imagine what most people would be like if they lost their cell phone. I myself would probably be relieved. Right? But the things of life, the things all around us can open us to a deeper meaning. And that's what Jesus is doing. In the Golden Girls episode, at the end of it, they're all around the kitchen table, most times, they're around the kitchen table and they're discussing the point of the episode, how they were unkind to each other or how they missed something, and they talked to each other. Okay. Well, what Jesus is doing in each of these parable stories, he's telling some aspect or point about the kingdom of God, or in Matthew, as Matthew calls it, the kingdom of heaven. He's telling us something 
about the fact that God's kingdom is all around us. Just think about today. And the beauty of today is very easy to see that, isn't it? Now, I'm going to remind you of this in November because we have interesting weather, don't we? Right? But each parable is like a flashcard. There's a point. Right? There's a point to it. And there's a word or something to remember. Now, I forgot that the iPad shows words backwards, so I'm going to show you a couple of them, see if you can figure out what it is. Okay. A flashcard. Trust. There's a parable about trust. There's a parable about mercy. I feel like I'm doing a jumbo with you. Jumbo. Right? Many about forgiveness. Each parable, there's a point. There's a word. See, because when you get interested in the story, you're engaged. Now, sometimes you got to listen closely to the story. But you'll hear parables usually, they used to say always, but now they say usually has one point. When you get into where they're discussing everything else, it turns into an allegory. Okay? So the story may be interesting, but just when you get caught up in the story, pow, you get hit with the point. Jesus is really good at this. Wish he could teach some classes on preaching, huh? We can't get caught up in the details of the story because you might miss the point. And I'm going to talk about one story tonight that kind of goes against that because the parable right there is transformed into an allegory. Okay, and I'll explain that to you. But... <clears throat> The parables to me are the most fascinating part of the Gospels because scholars believe that they are the most authentic words of Jesus in the Gospel. They were spoken by Jesus. Nice to see you with me, Nancy. You know, we've been through so many difficult times this past year and a half, haven't we? We need to hear the words Jesus speaks. And maybe if you're like me, you feel a little windblown and shell-shocked by everything we've been through. I don't know about you, but uh, I've lost a few friends to the virus. Uh, one of my greatest joys was my dear Iris, who's 13, got her first vaccine. And um, my family came together and everybody had been vaccinated. We met outside, we had wonderful food and gathering, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful to see. But still windblown, still by the effects, and wondering, how do we get my feet? How do you get your feet back under you so we can begin to live again? Why not try the parables? That's why I decided to do this. Why not try the parables and see if there are some points that flash out to you and both engage you and point you on the next piece of the journey. That's what I hope to do in these few weeks, that together we can enter the story of some of the parables and see what treasure we can find there. Because each parable is like a page on the triptych showing some point of direction on the journey. So this evening, I'd like to share with you two parables. They're two of the first parables in Matthew's Gospel. And while we're doing that, I hope you're having a cup of tea because I am. The first parable is the first parable in Matthew's Gospel. It is in chapter 13. If you have a pen there, write down chapter 13. Because they are both there. It's the story of the farmer, the sower, who went to sow his seed. 
And what we're told, first of all, the focus on the farmer. He is throwing the seed everywhere. He's not saying to this little patch of ground, you can have two seeds, you can have two seeds. No, he's letting it go freely. That tells us something about God. God lets love flow freely. It goes everywhere, God's love. It embraces everyone. Now, if I was God, I might be a little more miserly with that love and say, what did you do today? Do you deserve it? I think I would be a Santa Claus God. How about you? You know? But that's not what God is like. You know, we got a new little dog here. Um, we rescued a dog. She's nine years old. Her name is Lindsay. She has some issues. She has some special needs. And she is the sweetest little tiny golden retriever, very small. And she just needs acceptance. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe we're all a little wacky. I know I'm a little wacky. And in case I didn't know it, my friends tell me all the time, right? But isn't it wonderful to know that you're accepted even if you're a little wacky? Or even if you're really uptight? That's what God does, spreads the love. But then we hear about the ground, okay? And there's four types of ground. The first type of ground is the wayside. Now, what is the wayside? I didn't know, I had to look it up. Well, in Palestine, the common ground for the people was divided up into long strips, long narrow strips. And each person, they were men, could cultivate whatever they wanted in their long, narrow strip. And between these strips was a piece of land about three feet wide. And that's where everybody could walk to get to their property, to go back and forth. And, and there were no fences or anything like that. It was respected. But the ground in between was called the wayside. Now, if you know a piece of ground, maybe on your property, if you're on a corner, people are cutting through your grass, you know what happens, the ground gets hard. Okay? And when the seed falls there, there's no hope for anything because the ground is so beaten down and closed. What about the people? I'm not gonna say it's anybody listening, but what about the people who are closed-minded to anything? Certainly to the free love of God. I've told this story before, but I like to tell it, so if you heard it, forgive me. I was doing a parish retreat in New Jersey, and um, I was working with two Dominican priests, and the whole retreat was on the love of God. And at the end of the retreat, we gave out evaluations. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> we just say thank you and go home, but we gave out evaluations. And somebody wrote on the evaluation, what is this stuff about love, love, love? Bring on the Franciscans. Okay. I was like, what? The Franciscans are all about the love of God. So, love, love, love. Close-minded, you hear that? That's where that person is at that point. Close-minded, there's no place for the seed of God's love to get in. So there's no growth. That's the first type of ground. The second type of ground is rocky ground. Now I was thinking that that was like soil on the North Shore, rocky ground, but it isn't. Some places in Palestine, the dirt, the earth is so thin and there's a shelf of rock underneath it, okay? It's limestone. So there's only a little bit of dirt and when the seed falls there, it starts to sprout up, but it can't grow. Rocky ground. How many people go from event to event, from workshop to workshop, read book after book, absorbing everything, but never taking time to let it settle in to take root. You know, we've all been like these different kinds of ground, haven't we? 
in our lives. The seed can't grow. The third is thorny ground. Well, the ground looks okay. It's kind of what happened in one of our flower, flower pots. I thought the ground looked just fine. And a few days later, after rain, all these weeds were growing up. We were like, where did the weeds come from? Well, Michelle knew. I didn't. And I was like, wow. What happened was the ground was turned over, but not proper. <clears throat> like the earth in the pot took out the old stuff, the, the old plants, but there were still little seeds of weed in there. And when that weed grew, if we left it there, and it grew up with the plants, it would choke the plant. Well, sometimes we're just not ready. Sometimes we're not ready to hear God. We want to, but we have some other work to do. Say some things in the way. And we gotta deal with them. You know, too often we're not dealing with the stuff and it just stops us from accepting the abundance of this life. And finally, the good ground. Now, good ground was receptive enough to take the seed. It was deep enough to allow it to take root. And the soil was clean enough to let it grow. That's the hope for all of us. Now, what I just did was change the parable to an allegory. The parable had one point. God's gracious love. Pow. Isn't that enough? But what Jesus did, after he told that story, and he was sitting with the disciples and his apostles, you know, I, I always think they sat around later and had a little glass of wine and said, how did it go? You know, uh, maybe because I do that, but I do it with a cup of tea. I said, how did that talk go? You know, I wonder if Jesus said that. I don't know. Maybe he did. But they're asking him questions, and he begins to explain the point of the parable by showing each. Here's the point. God's gracious love. And it becomes an allegory when he shows us the different kinds of people. Why am I telling you this? Because the really important thing there was the first thing. All focus is on God. I've made a number of directed retreats in my life. And that's a one-on-one -on -one retreat. It's really one-on-one -on -one with you and God. But you have the opportunity to meet every day with a spiritual director. And I was blessed enough to have my own spiritual director as the retreat director most often. And he had this thing that he used to say to me all the time. Pat, focus on God. Get your focus off yourself and focus on God. If you learn anything else from me this evening or ever, I encourage you to remember that. Remember that. Take the focus off yourself and put it on God. So when we are asked what kind of ground we are, it's changing. Because not only do we, we honor and are awed by God's gracious love, but then we take it and we look at ourselves and I say, how am I doing? How am I doing? Bang. This story and every parable that Jesus told is his own. See, some of the Jewish storytellers would tell stories that other storytellers told, short parables that they heard from somebody else, like most preachers do today, right? But this is how Jesus began with this story in Matthew's Gospel. This is also in Mark and in Luke. Not every parable is in all of the Gospels. But how are you doing about accepting God's gracious love? How are you doing with that? And what kind of ground have you become in the past year and a half? I can't answer that for you. I can only ask the question. 
kind of ground are you? When I see people driving, and maybe you see this, I'm really wondering what we are like inside. That all of this anger and frustration is being demonstrated on the expressway or on a side street. So this parable is so telling. It's in Matthew chapter 13. I encourage you this week to pick up your Bible and read it. I was gonna send it, I was gonna send out the parable, but there's something about picking up the Bible and opening the book. It's a process that is demonstrative of our souls opening to God. Also, in Matthew chapter 13 is one of my favorite parables. I'm gonna read it to you. Little tiny story. You ready? It says. Now remember, Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. But when it has grown, it is the greatest of plants and becomes a tree large enough for the birds to come and make their nests in its branches. The end. The kingdom of heaven. Little tiny. Buried deep within us. We become the holy ground. We become the holy ground receptive for this. This smallest seed, tended, given space and time and nourishment to grow, becomes the greatest. I told you that our little dog, Lindsay, has some special needs. She's right here. And um, we're very patient with her. A friend of mine said, I don't know how you get all that patience with the dog, you know? And I looked and I said, easy. I'm a lot more patient with animals than I am with people, to be honest. But I said, when I deal with an animal or a person, I like to think about the potential that they have. Because everybody's potential is different, right? Your potential is different from mine. And then I just keep moving at that person, that animal's pace toward that potential. I don't know if God does that exactly, but I kind of think God does. How does that feel in your life? Do you believe that God has planted a piece of the kingdom within you? Long time ago, there was an artist, she was a nun, she was called Sister Carita. And she made banners. It's in the 1970s, big banner time in churches. And one banner said, <clears throat> we each hold a piece of the good news. I can't remember any other banner. I remember that one. We each hold a piece of the good news. My piece is different from yours. The seed God planted in me is for my potential to grow and blossom and give thanks and become an invitation to grace and of grace to others. I believe yours is very similar, but you'll do it according to how you do it. I was not feeling well a couple of weeks ago and um, I got a little bit better and the neighbors started to come in to see me and they brought all kinds of things. One brought cold cuts, the, the, the baking, oh my goodness. We were like, wow, you know. Our little seven-year-old friend, with the help of mommy, made brownies. And our not quite seven-year-old friend made regatta cake or pie. I guess regatta pie. Homemade. That's not my gift. My gift is to find the best bakery around, which I think is Bankerts and Center Reach. Hey, I don't get anything on that. I don't even, not even a discount, right? But, you know, when I'm in the area, I like to pick up something there because it reminds me of Queens where I grew up. There was a Bankett's 
And I always say, oh, wow. That's their gift. That's the gift of that bakery. My gift is I happen to have enough money in my pocket to buy something there. It's a good day. Hey. But I bring it to somebody else. That's my gift. Keep some, give some. That's what my neighbors did. There's a graciousness in that, that each of us fulfills our potential. This spring, Michelle and I had the opportunity to be outside our house a great deal. And we were looking around, we were surrounded by trees. And I know that we had to see at least 50 different color greens right around us. I'm looking at some of them right now. And each one brought its beauty. It is the same with us. We, we, the people of God, need you to tend that seed of God within you. Simple thing, but profound. It reminds me of something I heard about a man named John Harvard, who was an Englishman who came to this country in 1640. He lived a very short time after he arrived here. He was a wealthy man. When he died, he died here. And he left 700 pounds in English money and his book collection to a school in New England, small school. And you know what I'm gonna say next, don't you? That small gift put buried in creative hands made for Harvard University that today has over a thousand professors and over 10,000 students. How it grows, how it grows. So what's God's potential for that little seed inside you? And how's the earth of your life receiving it? All of the parables speak of the kingdom of God all pointing beyond us to God. And this week, I'm going to, I'd like to ask you to read both of those parables. They are both in Matthew chapter 13. And maybe reflect on those questions I just asked. How's the seed? Has your ground become a little hard, a little rocky? Or has, you, has this been a time to turn the soil and feed your inner life that you are ready for the next piece of the triptych? And if anybody's got one of these and you don't want it, would you send it to me? I'd love to have one. And maybe I can go to AAA and get one. I never thought of that. Uh, but the idea that the next thing is what's given to you you don't have to worry about the rest of it. Just this thing. God will take the gift of your life given to God and make it grow. So it really is an opportunity this week to celebrate all the great things that God does for us and in us. Even if you don't feel it, celebrate it. And then look at the ground, the ground outside of your house, the ground in your plants, the ground in your heart. And I'm going to ask you to join me in praying for soft, receptive soil. When the disciples were with Jesus, It seems that they were most impressed with the way he prayed. We don't hear that they asked him to show them how he walked over the hill or how he did this or how he, you know, they said, can you teach us to pray? So opening our hearts, I invite you to pray with me. Our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We open ourselves to you. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let's stop there for a minute. And Lord, we leave the prayer right there because we're asking you to tend our souls, to tend our soil. Give us this day our daily bread. And may we be for others as you are for us. For yours is the power and the glory. Amen. I'm so happy to spend this 40 minutes with you by the time we got the iPad up and running again because I'm excited about the parables. Why not take an hour a week? There's nothing on TV unless you're up at 3 o'clock you can watch the Golden Girls. But take this time to enter into a new place and let the summer become a time of great growth for you see all around us. We live in a wonderful place to celebrate growth, an island that is lush, abundant, just like God's love. Have a wonderful week, Matthew 13. Next week, we're going to take Three parables of a theme. You know, when Jesus felt like he wasn't getting across to them, he'd tell them another parable right after it to say, pay attention. We're going to look at particularly one of my favorites. And I'm even going to show you pictures of it uh, because I have some pictures that I like very much that are really paintings and not pictures that I took. Okay? But the opportunities to enter into the story. And we have an exciting story. I am really excited about the scripture and so happy to invite you into the story. And a word of advertisement, the Ports Chats are coming back. If you live in the local area here in Long Island, you are invited beginning July 8th on Thursday nights to Mary Immaculate Church in Bellport. We meet outside. There's plenty of space for social distancing. And it's an opportunity to be together not be afraid of one another, to open ourselves as receptive soil to the seed of God. Have a wonderful week. I love you. I wish you peace. And I wish you a great moment of insight when God goes, pow, see my love. Thank you and good night.